And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster that is Night Goddess Games. In the red corner, we have Math Matthew Muniz. I know I screwed it up again. And <laughs> in the blue corner, we have Nis Nix Tesseract. Is it a wrinkle in time, though? It is. <laughs> Good for you for not going Marvel. I mean, that's fine, too. But yes, it was derived from my childhood love and adult love, too, of uh, the Wrinkle in Time series. Mm -hmm. I, st I still have not seen the movie version of A Wrinkle of Time. I have no plans on seeing it because doing a movie version of that, of that book is was done way too late. The book <laughs> is so good. I feel like uh, I, uh, that's what I'm going to stick with. Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's, I mean, you've, you, it was, it was done, it was... It was done when the book was so old that you have whole generations who likely took inspiration from it. Hmm. Um, you had a you had a similar problem with John Carter. I mean, the Barsoom series has been around for over a hundred years, and so many people have taken inspiration from it in one form or another. Hmm. Uh, but time time zone management aside, how how are you two doing tonight? We're doing well. I mean, we're in the same time zone with you here, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a force of habit, <laughs> especially, especially especially since <laughs> sometimes sometimes time zones make no sense. <laughs> this is true. Like parts of Australia where there's where there's an extra thirty minutes added on no, only half of the year for some reason. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Or um, places up in Canada like St. John's Island where there's an extra 15 minutes added in. <laughs> nope, I'm... just Chicago. Yeah. yeah, we're doing all right. Mm -hmm. um, just, just, um, just Minnesota's little brother. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> sure. Wait. <laughs> Someone's a sibling. Maybe. <laughs> Oh, who, oh, who am I kidding? Minnesota's little br Minnesota's brother is is Wisconsin. <laughs> then again, every, every state in the Midwest acts, acts like the acts like the bickering relatives. It's just it's just some get the brunt of it more than others. That's right. Yeah, this is true. Mm -hmm. oh. And the, and the, and then there's Michigan, where where it, where the rest of the country is like. Which side? Which side of you are you, are you even on? Oh. Well, I mean, they all show you. It's a hand thing. Yeah, which is why I'm, gl I'm why, why I'm glad nobody from Florida tries to tries to do that. <laughs> but so a bit of a tradition is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So I'd like to. Have you guys have you guys walked me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what made it stick? And I'll I'll start with you, Nix. Actually, I was just gonna say let's go Matthew first on this because his roots go back much deeper than mine do. All right. Um. Yeah, my parents played basic D and D, uh, and they did it in college, and then apparently at some point. Turned away from that and left it in a bag for me to discover as a kid. And I got so into the idea that this was a game that was made of maps and cool dice and lists of monsters and spells and stuff. I just was like captivated, you know? Um, so I just like dreamed about when I would have people that would want to play games like that with me. And I found them in high school eventually um, and ran games all through high school. And it just stuck. It was. It hasn't always been like a hobby that's been um, tremendously active at all times. A couple times in my twenties and thirties, had to do other things. Um, but it has always just kind of been there in the background, percolating. And um, when I joined a theater company and we started making games um, and escape rooms, 
um, it gave me a chance to sort of see that the process of game making is really similar to the process of plays, to the process of songwriting, all these things that I had had a chance to do with a the theater company. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, this opportunity to synthesize tarot uh, and RPGs and everything I'd sort of learned from theatricality and the process of storytelling into one project just... They all sort of coalesced over the last four years or so. Mm-hmm. Now, and as for me, oh, sorry, go ahead. Now, it is it is funny that you mentioned that for re- for reasons I'll get into in a minute. So, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, what about you, Nix? Uh, well, <clears throat> like I said, I had a much later start into to gaming. I and I'm not exactly sure how it wasn't on my radar earlier because I was a theater major and so I was around theater kids all the time and I I know they had to be playing these games as well but uh, it just never was on uh, my radar as far as you know getting invited to any of that or knowing that it was going on or whatever Um, and so I was in my early to mid 30s I think it was before Um, so I had gotten married by that point and my husband was a role player and he had started a Uh, Pathfinder group. And I was in the next room frequently, you know, doing other things when when he and his group were playing. And I was kind of hearing what they were doing and started to get the idea of how this whole thing worked. And after, you know, a few months, I I walked in and I was like, hey, would I be able to do this too? And and I was hooked. I've, uh, you know, branched out considerably beyond uh, Pathfinder uh, since then. And, um, you know, tried kind of every flavor of RPG that's out there, but um, yeah, that is how I got into it. Mm-hmm. And given given those particular or, origin points, and <laughs> the whole thing with the with the fact that in this particular call you've got three theater brats, because <laughs> I I may I may not look I may not look or sound it, but I've I've had I've had my fair share of the, of theater experiences. Um, as well as well as the fact that um, the wor- the worst experience was ha- was having to was having a corpse, you know, beca- because that, because they just de- somebody decided it'd be real funny to have me have to play the corpse, and everybody and if you've done that at any point, everybody is going to try and make you crack. Doesn't sound fun. Well, it was fun for everybody else, not for me. <laughs> oh. And of and of course, of course, the whole the whole thing of gig, um random giggling is a good is a good way to get the director to want to kill you. You know, one person giggles, then everybody starts giggling. It is the definitely worst not the kind of thing I want to do. It is the worst kind of contagion because it go because once it starts, you can't stop it. Totally. But uh, given now, divination is uh, is obviously built around the tarot. So, where was where was your first introduction to the to the idea of the tarot and just this for, just this form of card based divination um well i and i'm i think tarochi is the origin word uh so i've always grown up saying tarot and i'm probably just going to keep saying tarot just to, I'm not i don't think your pronunciation is wrong particularly i think um people are now saying it a whole bunch of different ways and i just grew up saying tarot so as i talk about it i'm just going to say tarot yeah. uh i discovered it as an angsty teen uh in the same like D and D inheritance years um, from my parents, um, and I just really like that. There's a whole almanac of human experience in those pictures. They're just really good, um, stimulating thoughts baked into them, stories and parables and things that you're supposed to dig at, and extra layers of symbols that are meant to reveal new concepts over time. Uh, and they're good at it. They're just good at it for getting to story and getting to motivation of character. And so I just have always kind of had them in my left hand while running games, um, able to like use them to determine what an NPC might be thinking or feeling or to try and generate some kind of surprise or just for like the epic coolness factor of dropping the death card on a group of players for some random reason. Um, 
they've just kind of always been around um from a creative standpoint um and then like of course the fun party um like let's tell let's do readings for one another was a matter of like fun and like a little bit of teenage spookiness and then like just a bit of um insight and discussion and that they sort of prompt a way for you to think about yourself and discuss things just always stuck with me as a really fascinating medium so i always wanted there to be a game um that used them and in the last like 10 years i feel like there were a lot of games that came out that used them to world build and to generate ideas and to um you know um help create narrative content but there weren't any that really used them to make good crunchy like actual game gamey mechanics um which is really what i like playing games that um give you the resolution and satisfaction of rolling a dice you know what i mean um and i do like things that are nice world buildy fluffy gmless narrative things too um but i think when i'm going to really commit to a campaign i want to be able to like as a dm i need, i want uh, and i'm kind of a forever dm i always want to be able to hide behind a dice roll to know that things are fair that everybody that the drama can be fair you know um so i wanted that out of uh, something that we were going to make as a tarot based game too you know yeah so tarot's always been lurking around in the background of all the creative stuff stories um games all that um you know divination is just sort of a chance to synthesize all those things um mm -hmm. like what i love about good firm mechanics from white wolf games and D D in my childhood and what i love about theater what i love about tarot um how interesting and deep and artistic it is mm -hmm. now with that, with that in mind, with divination being being built on 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 tarot, this is obviously going to be leaning into the narrativist um, frame of mind when it comes to the kind of game that it is. But one of the one of the, one of the, the way you des the way you describe it, it's it it sounds like this isn't f this isn't full narrativist the way something like ever the way something like everway is unless unless i'm misreading but also no that's absolutely correct oh sorry go ahead finish but all, but also you talk you talk about this idea this idea of of create what it sounds like creating a he creating a collaborative hero's journey with one hero and the people at the table acting as aspects of the hero is that yeah. accurate yeah. Oh yeah, we're really proud of that. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that how that particular idea for the framing device came to be. Well, there are a couple games exploring shared heroes um, in really interesting ways. Um, Kids on Bikes has a shared hero that the group player characters get to use, and the magnificent Bluebeard's Bride um, has a shared hero framework. Um, these are like really narrative heavy games um, and they seem like they're made for short experiences um, but they gave me what I had sort of always been looking for in a narrative de like framework device which is a way to um, get really deep and internal really get into thoughts and feelings you know when you read like your favorite novels you often get the thoughts and feelings of all those characters I mean, you watch really great movies you get um, music and you get things that aren't present actually in the experience of the characters that give you deep insight into their feelings and in role-playing games you want to make space for that like I, I, the people's favorite experiences in most games are these moments of character growth in my experience that's when people really remember you know people might really remember an epic battle uh, and talk about it but how are you really going to relate like what made it cool that you rolled your fireball like um it's really about moments of growth and so um you know that's what tarot is about tarot is about like looking deep and and seeing something there and reading into it and fantasizing about it and so um making a game where four people share a hero means that you are always deep in their thoughts. Those are four ways of thinking that are in one person. And so when they get into an argument, what you're seeing is a person trying to decide what to do uh, or not being able to decide what to do or being conflicted about where they are um, and negotiating that, figuring that out lets the whole story be in the feelings of a character, like as much or as little as you want to be in a way that, uh, in a traditional everybody plays one character kind of thing, you have to make a little extra space for, you know? Um, so that's sort of the genesis. That's sort of what I think makes it special to me. I don't know. What do you think, Nix? 
Yeah, I, I want to go back to the um, the piece about, you know, the comparison to Everway and uh, just the, you know, how the mechanics kind of work into that as well. Um, because there is so much uh, narrative richness built into everything that you just talked about, Matthew, with the um, the sort of inner workings of this person's mind. Uh, it was really important to us that the that there also be a really rich mechanical experience. And so, uh, yeah, I would say that we do have um, more of a more of a crunch, more of a genuine RPG mechanic uh, structure to what we've we've built here than something like Everway. If your your listeners are familiar with that. Um, you know, we, we use the cards, um, definitely to generate narration there, you know, we're not, we would be, we would be foolish to ignore that, uh, th that richness that they offer to us. Um, but they also have numbers on them just like, a, a die does. And so we use them in that way as well. And, um, so between those things, you get this, this beautifully, uh, narrated inner life of this character, but then that that person, this is not just about the stories inside their head. That person is also navigating a story as the hero and taking turns, sort of driving the car, if you will, trying to, um, you know, navigate life and navigate a story as this hero uh, while they they trade off, you know, pursuing their different desires in control of that hero. And so you get uh, both the the narrative satisfaction and the mechanical satisfaction in in what we've created here. Mm -hmm. Now that br that brings me to how how this is how this is going to work. Since I mentioned Everway earlier, and even though it's using it's it's using the four the fortune deck and the seasons deck if you have if you happen to have that as well which i do but a lot of people are a lot of people look at the core resolution mechanic of a given rpg as a pa as a pass fail thing you know you roll die you compare it to a target number that determines whether or not you succeed at the action you're trying to do or you fail at the action you're trying to do whereas something like everway is not is it's not about pass or fail, but what happens next? A prompt for what ha for how something is described. Are you doing a, are you guys doing a similar approach, in the sense that when someone's attempting an action, it's based on what happens next, or is there a different approach that you are doing when it comes to resolving whether or not someone succeeds or not at an action? So um, a little bit of yes and to all of that, uh, because we do have a clear success or failure. Uh, the core mechanic of our game is the test. And so when something happens in the narration that the outcome is not a given, um, you know, the hero wants to try to do something uh, or needs to react to something, and we need to, you know, do basically a skill check to see if they are able to do that thing, um, that mechanic is is the test. And we get a clear numerical, yes, you succeeded at this, or no, you did not succeed at this, coupled with the imagery that is on the card, which, which lets us um, have some idea generation there in that moment of how, of what kinds of things played into that moment and why they they were successful or they weren't successful in that moment. And so I, I think both things are true, that it is, you're getting from the flip of that card, you're getting that clear and decisive outcome and, and decision just like you get from rolling a die, but you're also getting some, some narrative prompting in that moment. Matthew, is there anything that you want to add to that? No, that's really... Um... Yeah, I, I think you said it really well. Um, the idea that, um, you know, action, like I, it was important to us early on that if we were going to adapt the game for tarot, that we were going to make sure that we made a game that was just as satisfying to derive a result from as rolling a dice. And can you think about why you want to get around the table and roll a dice? Um, it's because it creates tension. It creates this moment of, 
you know, what is going to happen? There's a reason to cheer if you hit a really high number on the other side of that. And there's a reason for everybody to go, ah, if you roll a two, you know, um, that's powerful. And it lets the story be wild and feral, even to the storyteller, even to the GM or the DM or whoever that is. They don't know what the dice are going to do. And because of that, they aren't, they have like a certain amount of deniability and (laughs) they have a certain amount of ability to sit back and watch the show and enjoy it. Um, So we wanted to make sure that Divination had that. And so we have that because of the numbers and also to an extent the suits um, and because of a few other fun card-like mechanics that are unique to cards like having a hand or being able to shuffle or look at the top card. Those are all parts of ways that we've mechanized um, being able to interact with the deck as you play it. But in addition, like Nick said, the ability to read a story on top of all that means that it's not just a pass or a fail. Like the what comes next has a lot to do with what you reinterpret on that card and how it makes you feel in that moment. Um, and that element, it, I would say, is the maybe the the sort of spicy what comes next um, flavor that divination really offers. Is that um, tarot just does that so richly that almost every moment feels enhanced by looking at a picture in addition to seeing a result that's either characterized by critical success, pass, fail, or a disaster. Mm-hmm. Now, since you mentioned hands, that that brings up another um, thing I'd want to explore. Before I before I do, I'd like to ask: Are either of you familiar with the saga system, which was used in Dragonlance Fifth Age and um, the Marvel Adventure game? That t- both of them made by TSR in the mid nineties. No. I'm not either. All right, that was a card. That was a card-based system. It used it. It used its own deck known as the Fate deck, which looked different for both games. But more importantly, your hand was both how you did actions, but it was also your level and health. Now I'm cu- I'm curious with this. Do you have it that you ha- that um that the play that the players have their own hand that they're u- that they're utilizing to inf- to influence the world or is it a case where it's, it's a small- way smaller concept here in divination and its current incarnation we're still developing and doing campaign testing and seeing how branches extend out into leaves and flowers on this crazy tree um so things are growing all the time but it's not a hand based system it's a system that allows us to create hands here and there because it interacts so much with cards. So as a consequence of using some unique powers that um, some of the playable aspects have, you might generate a hand for yourself periodically. And then there are rules about how um, time, uh, downtime, growth, and experience might put those cards back in the deck or um, let you shuffle them back into the deck at a choice moment when you want to. Mm-hmm. But no, it's not a system that like depends on... There was another really good one in the 90s that um, was made out of poker hands. It was like a Wild West um, game. Damn, I can't remember. But Yes, and you were trying to get like poker hands to um, do result resolution of tests. So it's n- that was a hand based system, to my understanding, um, in my dim memory of it. Um, this is not like that. Um, this Dead- is still um, yeah sure. based on some other concepts yeah. generally. I I do want to add some context. Deadlands, um, that version was known as Deadlands Classic. Now, Ooh. the the that was a pre- that was a predecessor for what would eventually become Savage Worlds. Um, and, hmm, in fact, and in fact, the f- which is why the first setting that was made for Savage Worlds was Deadlands. The hand-based thing was used as part was used as the casting system if you were playing as a huckster. Oh, hucksters that's right. That's all familiar. Would make gambles with spirits to have them do spells as a favor to them. It's that is still the hucks. coolest thing in gaming I've ever heard. Even like even back then, I was like, "That is still the, that is like the coolest thing I've ever heard." That you play poker in the middle of your role playing game to mess around with demons is still the best thing I've ever heard. Of course, since they're hucksters, well, they do have a few options to cheat, because no gambler is ever going to play fair. <laughs> That's really fun. Mm-hmm. You know, every. You look. You look at any story that ha- that has that that has a poker moment, and there's inevitably somebody going to get accused of cheating. Then the table gets flipped, and the, and then the bullets start flying, as you do. Div gets a few moments like that. We have an aspect um, that you can play called the Fool, named after the zero card of the deck that can steal a card when it would come up in a moment of success, thereby like maybe taking away your moment of success. But then the Fool can save that card for future use if they want to. Mm-hmm. 
Um, we have a few we have a few ways that we use those um, concepts in general terms to cheat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And when I first saw this, I was a bit curious if this was doing a universalist approach when it came to what sort of world it's establishing. But you've already answered that with the fact that you are doing the modern myth, modern mythos kind of um, setting idea with the with the hero and his and his aspects related to what you refer to as the art a way mm -hmm. to um bend re a way to bend reality um in yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you bring that up because we actually at, in the early days of development this was going to be a uh sort of um genre agnostic system uh, that, you know, the tarot deck that you were using, uh, because there are so many fantastic decks out there, uh, that have such great story built into them, into their style. And, uh, and so at one point, the idea for this was that you could really just use this system to kind of tell any story that you wanted to, and, um, you know, maybe even flavor it along the styling of the deck that you were using. Um, very early on, though, uh, we we sort of realized two things. One, the, the obvious one is people don't buy a, a collection of mechanics; they they buy a world, you know. Uh, but two, the the bigger realization was that we already had one that that we had this. Um, you know, it was funny because Matthew was the uh, was the original um, brainchild behind this, and then brought me on a few months into his development. And um, when he would tell me about it, he would tell me that it was that it was you know genre agnostic. But then he also, in the stories that he was telling with it, there were these really tarot things that were always present. And and we started to look at that and go, oh wait, no, there is a there's a whole universe here and it's it's divi defined by the the tarot deck and so he really leaned into that and spent you know i mean gosh the next two or three years <laughs> really like <laughs> fleshing that out and defining this really rich world it's modern day and so it's really kind of you know our world if you will um with the things that are familiar to us but uh the underpinning beneath all of that is this tarot defined reality that if you tap into it as you mentioned you can access the ability to reshape that reality bend that reality change it to your will mm -hmm. i know you, i know you brought up white wolf earlier i'm curious if you had ever played mage oh yeah yeah, so I played all the White Wolf games of the 90s. So I played remember, every one of them. Mage the Ascension is a perfectly balanced game with no exploits whatsoever. I once saw a flowchart of how many stages of checkpoints you needed to actually go through in order to cast a spell. It was like a two-page flowchart of, like, check to see if this is distant. Do you know the name of the person you're casting on? Do you have a focus? Like, so many things, right? Uh, and you know what? I don't care. I loved that game. I loved that dumb game. I loved it so much. It's so good. All those flavors of magic. God, it lit my brain on fire. Um, The Matrix came out at the same time as I discovered that game. And then I had to rope all my friends into a The Matrix mage game that <laughs> still ranks as one of my favorite games of all time. I just loved that system and I loved that weird setting. And, I, you know, um, they used tarot imagery. Um, their world is so not defined by tarot of mage. It's so all over the place, just trying to, like, capture every fun portrait of what a wizard might be in the modern day. Um, like, it wanted wizard stories in cool ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and, damn, it was really good at that. Um, but it had all these cool pictures of tarot, too. Um, and what I would do when I would run things like that is write things that became early seeds for some of the world of this is go like, what if that were really tarot-y? What if that really told the story of the strength card? How, like, what would it, a mythos be like if we were building it out of these parts only and not um, casting so wide a net to just, you know, um, which I feel like um, was really required for that time. There really was, just wasn't anything else that let you play around with a flavor of magic like that, but it was super influential on me. Um, yeah, the game stands. It stands yeah. really, really well, I think. Now, 
I've seen some, I've I've had my experiences with games like Mystic Empyrean, where there isn't a, where there isn't a GM that's used, but the GM is essentially a baton that is passed around the table, or in in some cases it's full it's full GM less. Um, is div because of the nature of the whole aspects thing. Is Divination a game that could be played GM-less, or is it advisable to have somebody who is acting as the ref? Mm, I think a DM is essential. A Diviner is essential to our game as it stands. However, um, our character creation process, which is almost like a game unto itself, um, is like a rich narrative prompt creating... A, a narrative prompt... Um, system wherein you create a person out of stories that form them and not just the person but the forces of thought inside their mind and you can take a good long time with that i've played other gm list games that run about the same size and shape as our character creation and have a similar f purpose which is to um give everybody permission to be wildly creative and act on the story and make a cool thing that's what i've gotten out of every gm list game i've ever played mm -hmm. Um, so we definitely have something that plays kind of like that. And when I divine games for people during that, I moderate the experience, but I don't act on it. You know, you listen and you write down things so that you start to understand the hero that you're going to begin to mess around with and that you're going to attempt and, um, you know, put through crises and take things away from and give things to. Um, but really the people doing all the talking and all the creative work in that portion are the players. And that resembles other really amazing GM list games I've I've seen but once we get into it we then have a full gm structure for you to use to lead those characters through a, a long story uh, with a robust amount of growth xp and lots of things to buy lots of different ways to grow and change ways to change which aspect you are um and always 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 to change essentially what you are because you're a creature of thought um because you're a creature that doesn't have to look a certain way or be a certain size or sound a certain way um you really get to define for yourself what you are at all the points of the experience, you know. Mm -hmm. And because of how free, because of how freeform that is, I can I can see why you you um went with a particular setting because it with this kind of setup, it could be very easy for someone to get lost in the weeds. You've probably sure. heard the term analysis paralysis or choice paralysis. Guidance is a bit is a big thing in my te in my temple when it comes to assessing this sort of thing. Now, yeah, totally with with that in with that in mind, one of the things I wa I what I wanted to I wanted to ask is in regards to how the powers of the ar of the art would be would be utilized is it is it built on a is it built on certain limited resources is it built on um ch is it built on chance where does where does it um fall within things well the art specifically is the focus of the round of testing that we've been in for a little while but that will be the main focus uh, over the next six months mm -hmm. um because we're developing the package that lots and lots of people can use to run longer games with we've had the one shot version of it uh, out in the world for a long time and so the next version of things really gives you expansion to tell much longer stories and so as a part of that we're developing the art in especially in some new areas that are largely behind um construction tape right now um the biggest stuff the biggest weirdest stuff but what has been really fun is figuring out what magic feels like in a world informed by tarot and that has come down to um tricks and slights ways that um, artists pass amongst each other like little recipes of making the art work and it just does it's what they know how to do if you can open your third eye it becomes a muscle you can clench and use and there's not a lot of whole there's not a lot of reason to test that unless circumstances are less than ideal um for example, if you have a recipe that involves you're going to open a cosmic door that lets you fold space and go really far across the solid plane from your city to another city, and you're going to do it by drawing a door in chalk on a wall and then lighting a cigarette and laying it on the ground, and while the cigarette burns, the door opens for you like a normal door word would, and when the cigarette goes out, the door closes behind you. Um, and what we've done there is built a little recipe that invokes a little bit of fire and a little bit of air and a little bit of earth. And tarot is very conscious of those elements all the time. So from there, we can sort of like 
play a little jazz and see what it's like if you're um, a different type of artist from another, one that can improvise and go outside the rules of those recipes, or if you're a type that really deeply relies on those recipes, or if you're a type that wants to push past those or craft your own, make new uh, works of art that you can pass on to other artists. We've got um, rules that are in development for all that stuff and really robust rules for tricks and slights, the like um, go-to library of effects that artists pass amongst each other in the modern day as a kind of um, currency and as a token of which schools they've learned from or which circles they travel in. Um, there's sort of a culture that's getting built on top of the many different ways you'd be able to do that. Um, mm-hmm. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. So I, th- I think there's like a, a like a, a book version of the art and an improv version of the art that sort of reflect my own experience as an artist. Um, that there are very classical types, and then there are very improvised in the moment types. Mm-hmm. Um, we plan to represent both, and you know, all this language about art is, and you know, the idea that modern wizards would get tired of that world that word and look for culture and art and artistry is really just a nod to um pixie pamela coleman smith who is the artist of the tarot deck the rws the rider Waite smith tarot deck that everybody there's i'd say the 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 tarot deck that popularized tarot amongst modern um enthusiasts uh because of its pip cards and their incredible beautiful evocative illustrations the artwork of tarot is really so powerful and compelling it keeps people coming back to it all the time so it felt like um it was natural to make the language of our magic less about occultism and about um you know wizardry uh, and that 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 those terms would be considered antique in our world uh, and that what we're focused on really is you know, what's it like to be an artist? Like, what do you do with that power if you get it? Um, what's it for? Um, art asks those questions, you know? The way you describe it, it's more reminiscent of the magic system that's used in Unknown Armies. I'm not familiar with that. I'm not either. Unknown Armies is a interesting beast. <laughs> that, is, that, is one, that is one way to put it. It is also doing the modern mythos thing. Um, it was... It was a lot. It was um, groundbreaking at groundbreaking at the time for the fact that it didn't even try and do any sort of health thing, but ra- but rather a general description of your condition. Uh, hmm. There was there is also the fact that the it did have sp- it did have spells, but the idea of occultism in that in that fantasy sense is not present at all. And even the spe- even the spell types would not really be compatible with how people look at magic in the traditional sense. It sounds appealing to me. I really like that. There's an entire spell list that's just about photography. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, the the running the running joke about it is that is that it is described as cosmic bum fights. <laughs> Uh, All right. What's the name of this game? I'm writing this down. Unknown, Unknown armies. armies. I got it. I, I, I jotted it down. <laughs> Nix is ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, especially, especially since one of the big things about it is is exploring exploring urban rumors. So people have made um cr- people have made crazy ass rumor threads in various in various forums that Fun. could be used in the in the campaign. Um. And if and if it's if it sounds like it if it sounds like it predated um, the idea of creepy pasta, <laughs> oh maybe cool, that's um, cool. Somebody has to walk so that somebody had to walk so that creepy pasta could run. Yeah. Uh, but the, but there were there were whole there it is it is somewhat doing spell spell list, but to say it's like the typical spell list is. Very, very, very wrong. Um, it's one of it's one of Greg Stoltz's babies, and if if you're ever and when you're diving into the weird and wonderful world of in of indie tabletop, especially '90s and early 2000s, Greg Stoltz is going to be a name you're going to hear a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I hope you feel that way about the Div system when you take a look at it. That it's got yeah. some weird. Um, but it tries to something a little unusual. 
Well, we're, we definitely we're, wanted to have a flavor strong in particular to Taro. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the aspect sheets that were in that preview, mm -hmm. it, in a roundabout way, ends up reminding me of the playbooks that were present in um, Powered by the Apocalypse type games. Was that was that an influence? You ask, because Matthew definitely had the idea of how those aspect sheets work with powers on them and stats and all of that uh, prior to me coming on board. And when I came in, I uh, PBTA was a huge influence in my life at that time specifically. And so I immediately um, was kind of making that connection as well that like, oh, these are like the character playbooks. And I even to this day, I still... Um, we'll use that as shorthand to kind of help people understand what those are. Um, but I don't, I don't know that because Matthew, you weren't terribly familiar with PBTA before I, uh, before I introduced you to it, were you? Um, so I don't think that. Would yeah, really... I mean, I played um, Monster Hunters and, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Monster Hearts and uh, Bluebeards, and both of them have playbooks in this way that I was familiar. That was the convention, but I still take a lot of like um density interest i don't know what else to say really like i wanted to look like a character sheet from a lot of the games that i loved like what what do i flip to when i open a book i flip to the pages that tell you something about your class and i flip to the character sheet i just want to see what it's like to look at the console of the car you know what i mean um mm -hmm. so i think it is like you you call it a playbook and it totally is like it has a background side and it has a player side like a play side and it um it does all that and at the same time um, I kind of see like a version of the, the white wolf character sheet with the cool border. At, I don't know. Um, uh, the, at the very least, you're not sticking to that one page, one page only for character sheets that white wolf did back in the day, which is oh, I know. the reason why, ev why for the longest time, everybody I know uses Mr. Gon's character sheets. <laughs> to the point well no we have not just our just... well we have more than that too because we have a hero sheet as well oh, we yeah. like have not just the sheet for you the driver we have the sheet for your vehicle the car you're the hero of the story mm -hmm. too so yeah um that one's very non-traditional looking that one looks a little more even like um like a tarot apparatus to me um which is cool i really like that that character sheet really brings that evokes that vibe to me um the hero sheet but the aspect sheets yeah. um reminds me of some, something like Polaris or Nobilis. Oh, I, did you just say Nobilis? Oh my god. Um, by the way, Nyx, that was the game I was trying to remember to tell you. <laughs> like a couple of weeks. Yeah, we, I've been, we've been talking about Nobilis. Um, that's a really interesting reference. You know some deep games, Mildra. I've... I may not, I may not have started in the early days, but I ha but there's a, there's a reason why I call myself the monk. <laughs> oh man, that's a, and that's a that's a good one for a monk. I, I pulled am... it out because I was looking at like what would the densest game? It's such a dense game. It's so philosophically ambitious too. Um, Especially, I think I might if I'd never met Nix, I might have made that game myself, like a crazy person. <laughs> um, Nix really helped like bring a lot of clarity and a lot of like um, talk about um, indexing. That's a that's a that was a tough one to digest. Um, and beautiful, like just so ambitious and crazy and beautiful. Um, did you ever play Nobilis? Yeah, I've I've played I've played a few ra rounds with it. Um, it's I won't say it's that game that introduced me to Rebecca Borgstrom, but it's definitely one that showcased what she, what she could do. Um, if anything was my introduction to her, it was ex it was Exalted, and mm. something. Something to note when it comes to how I approach role-playing role games is, even before the internet, I was a bit of a maverick, um, which is a fancy way of saying asshole to some. <laughs> but it was more the fact that I that I was very I even in my early days was very vocal about the about this idea of what we're supposed to be doing and chat and asking why um, when. When the when some when some of the people at one of my old tables w was against the idea of drawing inspiration from things like video games or manga, I'm like, why? And I, I'm and then f when that escalated, I was like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it anyways, and I'm gonna do it better than you, because uh, I knew I knew that's where the wind was gonna be blowing. And history, I think, has proven me right. <laughs> but hmm. 
the the unorthodox appro approach is something I'll always bring in because in the in those non-standard approaches, you have the opportunity to bring people in who have who um don't have the same say fa don't have the same say Tolkien-esque background in terms of how they view the fantastical. You've you for instance got a whole generation who got into the idea of fantasy with a modern spin through that neo-gothic movement of the 90s. Yeah. Um, you know, what whether it be stuff like the Buffy verse, whether it be the urban vampire archetype that we see with Lost Boys and then and then Blade. Uh and that's something to take advantage of instead of shunning. Of course, it, of course I can always I can always reference that one line from from um C.S. Lewis's bo books do not do not cite the deep magic to me which I was there I was there when it was written <laughs> but the and I I will I will admit that the reason I thought I thought of the playbooks when looking at the aspect sheets is because of is in part because of the way powers are set up but also the background setup, the section about your nature, pro like for the fool, their nature, your private space, your companion, that kind of thing, as well as the fill in the blanks about the siblings. That is, some, that is very reminiscent of um, Powered by the Apocalypse. Uh, totally. Yeah, I would say the big difference is um, with a PBTA game, you can fill that stuff out at home before you get to the table. And in our game, uh, we discovered, you know, it, it used to be that way in probably the first six months or so. Uh, it was the same that you could you could fill out your aspect stuff. And then we came together and created the hero. And then at some point we went, wait a minute, but the aspects are the hero like that. They can't they can't form in isolation. They they have to form together. They have to be informed by the same stories that Matthew was talking about earlier that inform the creation of the hero through that process and and so we interwove those things a little bit more intricately and and now it's all part of that character creation process that we do together as sort of this little it's almost a mini game before the game uh where we kind of go back and forth and we we hit these key moments through the hero's development throughout their life and we go, okay, you know, here's uh, what was happening with the aspects at that time. And so look at these questions on your sheet. And here is uh, where the hero was at. And I'm going to pull a tarot card that's going to help us tell a story about something that happened to the hero around this same time. Mm -hmm. Now, there, obviously, there's there's been a lot of emphasis in the talk so far about the major arcana. But how how would the minor arcana be used within within this game? Talk about the deck a little bit. So um, for listeners that might not be as familiar with the exact makeup of a tarot deck, uh, there are 78 cards. And uh, as you alluded to, they're broken into major and minor arcana. The major arcana, there's 22 of those. And those are the ones that have the big names. These are the ones that when somebody's drawing tarot in TV or movies, uh, these are the ones that you see. It's it's stuff like the tower and death and some of the ones we've mentioned tonight, like the fool and 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 uh, these these cards that have these uh, big names and big moments in them. And uh, so in our game, uh, those twenty two cards, we've got eight of them that are the aspects. Those are your like we were saying your 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 playbooks. Um, and so those are the the portions of the hero that you could be playing. And then the other 14 that are left uh, become sort of the definition of the this magical universe we were talking about. Seven of them become sources of magic and, and seven of them become roads that lead to those sources that, that you could walk as an artist. Uh, and then the minor arcana, you've got um, really, it's very similar to the makeup of like a deck of playing cards where mm -hmm. you've got ace through 10, and then you've got some court cards. Uh, we've got 16 court cards. Um, so there's four in each suit. There's a, in most decks, it's a page and a knight and a queen and a king. Um, and there are four suits, just like in a playing card deck, but uh, instead of hearts and, and diamonds and whatnot, we've got swords, wands, cups, and pentacles. 
Uh, and so in divination, uh, those, those suit, uh, minor arcana cards, we divide that into two decks. We've got the aces through tens in all four of those suits. And so that makes 40 cards altogether. And we call that our lesser deck and that's our D 20. That's the thing that we use to draw from, to resolve, uh, encounters and whatnot. Uh, and then the court cards, those pages and knights and, and queens and kings from the four suits, we call that our figures deck because in reading tarot, the court cards um, tend to represent um, personas, types of people. A lot of times when, when one comes up in a reading, it is either a person that you know, or maybe it represents you. If you're going to choose a significator for yourself, a lot of times you, you choose a court card. Um, and so because they are so readily attached to personas, those became our generators for NPCs. And we've got a lot of uh, mechanics built around uh, the NPCs in the game, particularly ones that are attached to the hero, the ones that the hero has close relationship with, mm -hmm. um, based on the figures card that is assigned to them, they'll have some boons and other mechanical benefits that they can offer to the hero when they're, when they're in their presence. Mm -hmm. And the way, th the way that it's, se it seems to be, it seems to be described is that you are not using a unified deck. You're have you're having, um, you're having the what would be the unified tarot deck be set be separated into different forms of use. Yeah, the um, the lesser deck, like I said, is the is the um, the aces through tens. So those mm -hmm. forty cards are split out, and that's the main one that you have on the table with you. Um, that's the one that uh, <laughs> those of us that are running a game tend to just sort of mindlessly sit there and shuffle the entire time while we're listening and, and divining. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's the one that uh, gets drawn from most frequently. Um, the aspects deck if you want to call it that the eight aspects um four of them are, are utilized in the game of course because you've got four players four aspects and we actually lay those out on the table in what we call the hero spread mm -hmm. uh the other four technically aren't used in the game though, though i and some other diviners i've seen do some really creative things where they they bring in those other cards and maybe they shuffle them into the deck and do something fun with them when they come up uh, there's all sorts of you know creativity that you can that you can inject into this with the cards that aren't being used specifically in another place. Um, same thing with the 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 road and the source cards. Those other fourteen um, major arcana cards. They your your artist your hero is most likely going to be connected with one particular road in their story, and so the road card and the source card get shuffled into that lesser deck and if one of those cards comes up when you're just trying to resolve a, a normal test um then that can trigger some special moments of the art mm -hmm. um but then you've got you know 12 other major arcana cards that aren't being used uh which again you could shuffle them in and do fun things with them you could set them aside and and pull them in during you know key moments um there's any number of things that you can do with the the cards that aren't specifically being used to resolve those encounters. Mm -hmm. Now, that I think what I think one of the interesting things that you have in that regard is the way passive and active tests are using. Um, active tests you're trying to aim high. Passive tests you're trying to aim low. Correct. Oh. Yeah, and just to unpack that a little further for your audience. Um, an active test is when the hero is acting on the world. So that's typically something that they have, you know, in the game parlance, the, the player has said, I want to try to do this thing or, or whatever. Um, that's going to trigger an active test if it's something that they can't just do. And a passive test is the world acting on them. So those are typically called... By the diviner, sometimes the uh, the players know what it's being called about. You know, if they step into the street and the diviner says, there's a car coming toward you, <laughs> barreling, trying to hit you, let's do a passive test to see if you can dive out of the way. They know what that's about, but sometimes the diviner just says, let's do a passive test of such and such to, to find out, you know, <laughs> something that I know about that you don't here in this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the difference. And so then as you pointed out, active test... Uh, you're shooting for a high number to succeed. 
and a passive test you're shooting for low. Yeah. And that, by the way, is drawn conceptually directly from Tarot, which talks all the time about active forces and passive forces. Sometimes coding those as like masculine and feminine or invert and um, upright. But it's um, you'll see a lot of discussion when you, when you read about Tarot about what forces within the deck are active and which are passive. Mm-hmm. And it, sound, it also sounds like the way that the suit is get, is going to be used is is um is that it can determine whether or not something is a critical success exactly uh-huh. every skill that you can test in divination is associated with a suit and you succeed when you succeed and the card that um allows the test to be read as a success mm-hmm. uh, is matching the suit that so- is associated with the skill then you have a critical success you get what you want and then some and again all, all of that informed by the emotions, feelings, um, stories, and images, and established meanings of the cards as they come up to help resolve those tests too. Yeah. Now, there there's talk of um, su- of suit stats on the aspects. So, given how that whole active and passive thing is used, how would the how would an individual stat for a for a given suit af- affect the um, action? Well, every aspect has suit stats um, that determine how in particular connected they are to the suits of those quadrants. So if I have a plus two in wands, then I am particularly good at the skills associated with wands when I'm in control of the hero. That sort of implies that there's like a part of you that is good at stuff and maybe a part of you that is bad at stuff for different reasons. Um, This kind of goes to some thinking about like um, myself as an artist, sometimes when I sit down to practice piano, which part of me really wants that experience and which part is the part that wants to be on stage and which part is the part that wants to sit in a room by myself privately and practice. Those are different parts almost, you know? Um, So they have different strengths. Um, As a general rule, anything that gets added to your character sheet, your aspect sheet applies to you and you alone. And anything that gets added to the hero sheet is something that everybody gets to benefit from. So on the hero sheet, all those skills are listed. And if they're checked as trained, then everybody is good at the stuff the hero is trained in. But you might be particularly good or particularly bad at other skills because of your own disposition as an aspect. Mm-hmm. And is, so since you mentioned the plus two, if, I'm, if, say, if say that someone's drawing for an active test, does that... Does that, does that affect the number that would be needed? Yeah. In active tests, you the initial range of success is 6 to 10, mm-hmm. which is 50%. And you expand your range of success with a concept called swing. Every point of swing raises your chance of being successful by widening the window. So on active tests, you become successful not just on 6 to 10, but for every point of swing, 5 to 10, 4 to 10, 3 mm-hmm. to 10, widening the window of success. Uh, likewise for passives, if you have swing for from your suit stats or from some benefit of your powers or from any other source, uh, you're initially drawing aces to fives, but will expand the range of your success, maybe six, maybe seven, uh, making it easier for you to succeed. Mm-hmm. Likewise, the diviner can impose risk on a moment that is particularly fraught, dangerous, or what you're trying to do is complicated, and risk acts as a negative modifier against swing. Mm-hmm. Um, so just like, um, really similar to how other games kind of can apply a push pull dynamic between, um, storyteller and the players as a, as the situations demand, you know? Yeah. And one more, maybe other like critical rule to consider as a difference between active and passive when you're thinking about the, mm-hmm. the game itself is that active tests let, um, the players have a chance to use teamwork. It's really important in Div to think about what you're trying to do and who's good at it and how to collaborate. So aspects can be in co-control of the hero to make themselves more versatile, or they can swap out control so that the play, the aspect who has the particular strength in the moment calls for is the one in control of the hero doing the thing. But when a passive test is called for, you're caught in a moment where whoever's in control has to react to the moment. So there are two really firm dynamics of tests at play. One where I can stop things as the diviner and look for a resolution to something based on whoever's in control, whatever the moment is. Or active tests where you get a chance to design the solution and attempt it against the world. Mm -hmm. And a really interesting dynamic that that sets the stage for then is, you know, Matthew mentioned earlier, he was talking about the example of the fool has this power where they can steal a card that maybe it was going to be read as a success and now they've 
they've swiped that card and and maybe taken away the success because maybe the one that's going to replace it won't be now. And there are a lot of places like that where powers will allow you, if another aspect is doing something that maybe you don't agree with, um, you know, Matthew talked about the collaborative aspect of this, and there's absolutely um, places where that happens where the aspects go, oh man, we all really want to make this happen. What can we do to work together here? Oh, you've got a better swords stat. Let's get you in here in control to actually do this when we do this test. And But then on the flip side of that, if you've got an aspect that doesn't agree with the course of action, uh, they, they can go, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to give you my wands that mm-hmm. here. I'm going to, I'm going to sit this one out. You, you really want to do this? You got to do it with your negative two over there, you know? <laughs> and um, it's just really interesting to see that play out in actual conversation when you think about, I don't know, like with myself, I think about the times that I feel like I'm sort of self-sabotaging. It's like, oh yeah. So like there are some parts of me that are kind of fighting this out right now and and somebody didn't want to use their stat, did they? You know? (laughs) And now a lot, I, I am, I did notice that a lot of the powers utilize psyche. Now, yeah. the use of the use of it, I can I can put two and two together on that. If a if a power says that it uses psyche, then you need to spend that much in order to use it. Simple. One thing I'm curious about is recovery of psyche. Is it a case where you recover it completely in a scene change? You recover it when um when when enough t- when enough time is passed. Um, how would an aspect recover psyche? There's a few answers to that, um, and you, you've hit on them uh, in, in many points here. Um, we're still tweaking the balance a little bit in the longer game um, in terms of how much you get back at certain rest points. Mm-hmm. Uh, as Matthew said earlier, we have um, really finely tuned the one-shot version of this, and so um, in in the one-shot play, um, and actually this is even in longer term, at any time you can choose to trade XP that you have earned um, for getting back Psyche or um, also for, for replenishing powers that you've used because those are the powers are single use and so you, you mark them off when you use them and then you have to sort of re-up them before you can use them again. So So XP can be exchanged for those instead of you know, storing it up um, for longer term growth, you can use it for these more immediate, um, like I need to get this thing back right now. Um, There are powers that can restore your own psyche or do it for other people. You can, you you know, you can get psyche back for your fellow aspects. Um, There are uh, some big checkpoints, like the end of a, like a chapter or an episode or wherever, where you've, you've come to really a, a transitional moment in the hero's longer story where, yeah, you definitely get sort of a reset of everything. Then everything comes back. Um, and then, like I said, we're, we're still kind of balancing exactly how much you get back during, um, like a downtime or an introspection or something like that. Uh, that'll be one of our, our main things in the next round of campaign testing here. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, given how wide of a, of a set of possibilities that you have with this system, I am I am curious if you if um if you have plans on on within the core book putting in some some set of story seeds or or some sort of um some sort of some sort of mini one one shot. I realize the redundancy of that statement <laughs> to. <laughs> To help to help ease people in as far as what they can potentially do, since saying the mo- the modern world with with mythic is a very wide net, and giving direction with that net is paramount. For sure, yeah, we've got um, for each one of the seven roads, um, we've got you know an overview of what types of artists are called to this road and what are the values and the drives that are associated with this road. And so what does it look like if you're in um, sort of an upright alignment with this road versus an inverse alignment with this road? Um, How might that color your story? So we've got some, you know, uh, groundwork, foundational stuff there. Um, And then right now uh, we've got one entire module, I think, what is it, 70 or 80 pages right now, Matthew the Well, uh, that is um, specifically 
a sort of a tutorial module. So it, um, you know, it, it, it teaches both the diviner and the players um, kind of how to play the game, how to use the art, what the world is all about. And that's set specifically with a hero that's going to be walking in the road of two lands. Um, and that's got, you know, NPCs for you to actually draw from with their, um, you know, what, what kinds of use of the art they've got available to them and, and some character description and, you know, motivations and things like that and, and some locations and a very fleshed out setting and, and even, uh, kind of a, a, a chapter set up where it's like, you know, these are the, the story beats that you want to try to work toward and hit. Um, and I think our, our longer term goal is that uh, eventually we'll have at least one of those modules for each road, each road source pair. Uh, whether or not those all go in the core book, I, I doubt that any more than uh, one sort of exemplary one will be in there uh, in the initial core book. And then the rest will either come as, you know, a supplemental printing or, um, I mean, obviously something that is downloadable as a digital resource. Um, and some of that will be contingent on, you know, what kind of stretch goals we unlock on our Kickstarter right now as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And as far as the guidebook, what are you shooting for as far as the page count of that? Um, stretch goals notwithstanding, obviously. Yeah, I, again, that's going to be somewhat contingent, but we're we're looking at probably between 250 and 300 pages right now. Mm-hmm. And your typical eight and a half by 11 uh, trim. So, you know, we... We've got this gorgeous art by this just phenomenal lead artist, Joana Fraga from uh, Brazil, and we want to we want to feature that. You know, we don't want to have a little a little six by nine or whatever that um, you've got these small pictures, especially since her artwork is primarily going to be featured on the, the tarot deck. Um, but we've had we've been having her create the individual pieces of artwork at the size that we need to be able to print it in a in a book in an eight and a half by 11 book um so that we can let people really like get a close-up look and, and luxuriate in that art a little bit mm -hmm. that certainly makes sense and what would you be shooting for as far as a release window not a date but a ballpark yeah, our um our commitment to our our backers right now is uh, January of of 2025, so a little under a year. Um, and you know the game's been in development for four years already, and uh, like Matthew has said, we've got a you know a, a fully playable and very well tested one shot set of rules, and the campaign stuff just needs uh, some tweaking, um, some balancing, a um, couple of questions answered, and a little bit more fleshing out of you know some of the antagonists and stuff like that in the world, but. Um, Really, uh, we're going to have to stretch over the next few months for Joanna to finish the the rest of the artwork for the deck anyway. She can only move so quickly, obviously, um, with that. And and that six to seven month time frame um, should be really reasonable for us to also finish the editing and uh, layout and whatnot that we need to do on the book itself so that we're ready to be, you know, sending stuff off to printers and factories Um in the late fall or early winter to hit that January deadline. Mm -hmm. well, late, late fall or early winter. You're, you're in the Midwest. There's, there's no, su there's no such thing as fall. <laughs> it's brief. It exists for, like it, it's like three today. glorious weeks. Exactly. Although this year was awesome. There this year only, was great. There are only four seasons in the Midwest. Approaching oh, I know winter, this one. winter, still winter, not winter. <laughs> oh, the last one had to be construction. I, was I swear. Say you missed road construction. <laughs> right. Yeah, too easy. Everybody's everybody's heard. The Mildred English throws the small thing. fish back. <laughs> Let's get it's catch and release. I don't feel like pissing off the DNR. <laughs> you want you want to get you want to get in bad with the with the fishing mafia? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, but I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops and what sort and what sort of crazy um happens worst case scenario someone uses this to do their own version of everyone is john <laughs> i.e i.e the character the player characters are voices in john's head everyone is john is a one is a one page game that is one giant shit post <laughs> oh i've never Familiar. heard of this <laughs> It was made. It was made as part of one of those twenty-four hour challenges, I think, 
you know, where you've, uh-huh. you've got 24 hours to make a game. So that's funny because it feels like a parody of our game. <laughs> yeah, except everyone is John it did has definitely been... predate us, but yeah, it predates you by a, by a while. So it's a pretty savvy parody to predate <laughs> concept. <laughs> no, I, I understand. Not related in the slightest, mm-hmm. but yes, our idea not shit posting. Mm-hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Thank yeah, you for having us, Mildred. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I'll remember that for next time. I, I'm also going to come with uh, a lot of questions about deep cut RPGs, because I suspect that there are some other weird cul-de-sac games that we could talk about that were published between... <laughs> 1996 and the year 2005. That's what my guess is. Do you want the short answer or the long answer? Wait. Uh, I I feel like I'm gonna get the long answer. What 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 are we? What are you? What's your favorite game in that time period? So what? You what was the what was the time frame you gave me? 96 to 2005. That was like my I would say like the the deepest dive I got into like childhood lose myself in games kind of vibe. 96. And then I went away for a while and studied art and then came back to it as an adult, you know. 96 to 05. That's a very very wide net. Oh. So I opened the can of worms. Instead I'd ha- instead I'd have to give a, f- a few highlights. Um one of th- one of those highlights was Fireborn. Oh, I don't know that one. That one, that one was accused of being a World of Darkness ripoff. It was one of it was one of the non D twenty things that Fantasy Flight Games did back in the day. Um, it 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 is described as dual era role playing, where you are playing two characters, a dragon in the time of ancient Atlantis, and the modern reincarnation of that dragon, and going between Whoa. eras during play. There, I'm into it was also a sliding stat setup with its dynamic d6 system. Um, I can te- I can technically throw in Legend of, Legend of the Five Rings because I think that did start in the mid to late yeah. 90s. Um, Legend of yeah, the Five Rings sure. has been one of my favorite RPGs and I've always I've always had to shoot people down whenever they do the it's not re- it's not a historically accurate depiction of samurai thing because L5R isn't taking place in Japan. Is taking place in Rokugan. Um, I always wanted to play that one, but I never had anybody that knew the system. Um, ex- I will also note Exalted Second Edition. Also very cool. Yeah, um, very cool. I I have dipped into Third Edition. I don't care for th- I don't care for Third Edition, and the reason might sound petty. By scrubbing out all of the anime influences from Exalted, especially when it came mm. to the visual representation of it. Exalted oh, that must have happened edition. after I was keeping track. Exalted 3rd Edition just feels like an- just feels like yet another um, high fantasy pastiche. And I feel that's kind of missing the point. Hmm. Like, the 2nd Edition GM's Guide had a running gag of giving different advice that amounted to and I'll form the head, even name dropping that. Have hmm. they to drum up hype for it? They had Udon handle making a um fi- making a five issue limited comic. Like the hmm. the manga stuff was something that it wore that second edition wore on its sleeve, and I was always I remember that, that influence. That's like sort of where my bookmark for that it, that lies at sort of an anime influence. So I don't remember it getting reinvented out of that. That might have happened after I took my eye off the hobby for a little while. Um, I got a gift. Hang on, I'm going to tell you my favorite RPG from that time period because I'm dying to tell you about it. It's called Star Children and it's about aliens. Have you heard of this? Yes. It's like you you play you really? I'm so delighted. You're the only other person in my whole life that has ever said yes to that. You play like a like a David Bowie style alien rock and roll artist, uh, Nick. I'm telling you this now because you're the one who needs to know this. And you make like a an alien rock star 
it's an RPG like that to kind of like fight the system and be a badass. It's really fun. What's it? It feels like now almost all games that get like um, a lot of boutique game hype are kind of designed after that fashion. They're just a really interesting high concept delivered with like a ton of flair and ambition. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the name of it again? Star Children, right? Um, Huh. And Star Children. I. The Velvet Generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's de- it's definitely it's definitely something that that is coming str- is coming straight out of um, Ziggy Stardust. Yeah, which that's for- like my favorite game of the era. I never got a chance to play. Which so I'm gonna have to when I finish this. <laughs> first thing on the list. I'm gonna look for Fireborn though. That looks really interesting to me. Yeah, there's there there was certainly that there was um. Uh, um, Mechton Zeta, which is one of the definitive Mecha RPGs. I will freely admit that a lot, a lot of my favorites are going to be in that weeb category because one, spite, because everybody <laughs> kept telling me I shouldn't do that, and two, and two. Uh, there's just there's just a lot of interesting co- concepts in that area. Um, I have to bring up Weapons of the Gods. Um, I don't know that one. You know all these games. That's crazy. Weapons of the Gods is a, is based on a is based on a um on a manhwa of the same name. It is very much a wuxia um style affair. Um, it introduced this I- this idea of a d10 based die pool system that is almost akin to Yahtzee because you're not trying to roll high or roll low. You're trying to roll sets. Hmm. The idea being, that you, you if you you roll a set of d10 based on attribute and skill, the number of di- and the tens digit of your result is the highest set that you roll. The ones digit is the facing of that set. So rolling f- rolling five ones is a result of fifty one. You can bank die that you're not using into what's called the river and use those for later rolls. That sounds fun. Mm-hmm. Well, there, there's a variety um, when it comes when it comes to that, and I appreciate this deep knowledge you have here of these. This is cool. Mm-hmm. That's a, that is a cool thing to come back to these games and even, and hear that you know Star Children. That's exciting yeah. to me. Oh, well, I've really appreciated this chat. Thank you so much for yeah. having us on. Yep. And yeah, anytime sure. you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>